everyone has irrational fears, but unfortunately the irrational fear of cancer is actually quite a rational fear because when you understand the data, you know that males have a one in two risk of developing and one in five risk of dying from cancer and females have a one in three risk of developing and one in six risk of dying from cancer. Cancer impacts everyone, regardless of if you're black or white, rich or poor, elderly or, 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 or young, everyone, and cancer is truly an indiscriminate bully. I'm sure there are very few humans alive that haven't been impacted by cancer in one way or another within their network. In fact, it's one of the few things we have in common across our great nation. We all hate cancer. And the ugly truth is we have a very limited data set driving our approach to healing from cancer. The only toolbox we really have any data on is pharmaceutical science because that's required by the FDA, by pharmaceutical manufacturers to get approval. Everything else is typically unfunded or underfunded. And even our pharmaceutical data is quite limited in, 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 in understanding different variables. As an example, there's no data set to tell me when it's okay or safe to stop my cancer treatment. The research just simply doesn't exist. And the one fact that we can bank on is that cancer rates are expected to only grow over time. There were a few things that I learned on my cancer journey that really changed the outcome and in fact, probably saved my life. The first is that you can track not only lagging like PET scan and CT scan data, but you can also track leading indicator data for many cancers. For example, for me and colon cancer, CT DNA and CA199 were very good predictors of cancer activity in my blood yet doctors rely on only lagging indicator data. So it was up to me to identify what of that leading indicator data looked like and begin to collect that and inform my doctors of how my cancer treatment was truly really going. The second thing I learned is your oncologist is only educated in one lane, but there are six lanes that we can consider, and we'll get into these toolboxes in just a minute, but there are six lanes you can consider when you're building your cancer strategy. It's really imperative to understand that your doctor was only trained in pharmaceutical science. The third learning I had is that you can prepare your body for cancer treatment to maximize the opportunity for it to actually work, to create that alchemy in your body, and also to minimize side effects. So I took a number of different um, uh, supplements and additives and changed my diet and lifestyle so that I would be ready to accept chemotherapy and immunotherapy. And that's really something that no one else taught me. And ultimately, the last learning I had that saved my life is you have to advocate for yourself and be a data G. You cannot rely on others to help save your life because it is truly your job to understand your health and data and help others see how they can help you. I had a very interesting story. I have no family history. I had no symptoms and no reason to believe I had cancer. In fact, I went to my annual physical in the spring of 2022 with not a worry in the world, except for my family has a history of heart, heart issues and heart, heart attacks. So I wanted to be as proactive as possible. So I shared that with my doctor and in fact, went immediately after my checkup to have several different heart tests and, and, and was able to see I was pretty date clear as of April, 2022. But she called me and said, Julie, there's some interesting, interesting things in your blood. And in fact, for the first time, you're low on iron. So I'd like for you to go and get an upper and lower endoscopy. I've been pretty stressed at work. I'd had a big project that I was delivering. Of course, it was the pandemic and I've had some family dynamic changes. So it'd been a tough few years overall. When I called to request the upper and lower endoscopy and the lower endoscopy is also known as a colonoscopy, I was told I was under the recommended screening age and because I had no family history, I could probably get away with just doing the upper endoscopy. And luckily I said three different times, listen, I'm a data gatherer, I'm a data gal. Let's go ahead and get this data because I'd rather understand the full picture rather than just get a shortcut. I was woken up from said colonoscopy by the doctor telling me my tumor was so big, he couldn't even get the infant camera around to see the other side. I was in shock, to be honest. I had no idea what I was facing, and I decided that I would not live in fear. Instead, I wouldn't play the role of sick patient until I was actually sick. So a few days after being diagnosed, I traveled out to see my very favorite band at my very favorite venue of, venue of Red Rocks, Colorado, and decided at that moment in time, I was going to live in joy. And that was the very first time I decided to live in joy, but it wasn't the last time I decided to live in joy. And in fact, I decided I would let data guide my strategy and not worry until it was truly time to worry. I had two strengths to leverage. I've been a long time, 20 year career of industrial organizational psychology, and I throw a mean theme party, but I also live in a very healthcare dense city. So I have access to some of the best medical teams possible. 
A few weeks later, my colon actually closed, meaning I couldn't digest food. And that forced emergency surgery where they removed a foot of my colon along with 61 lymph nodes and my appendix. After we got the pathology report back, my surgeon shared I was a stage in three, I was a stage three C because eight of my 61 lymph nodes had come back as positive for cancer. I didn't take that news very well, to be honest. And in fact, I begged my nursing staff to give me whatever medicine they could to help me go to sleep because I was worried that my sobbing was going to rip apart my stitches. But that next morning, I woke up ready to face the world. And in fact, I wasn't going to once again decide to live in fear. So I woke up and went and talked to the charge nurse and asked if we could have a little fun. And she asked, what could you possibly mean for fun? And I asked her if we could throw a disco walk. And so that evening, I invited all of the other patients on my hall to join me. I'd created a really fun playlist and, and had my unicorn um, it, you know, animal to help protect me. And we took off and, and took, to the, took to the hall and everyone walked with me to some really fun disco music like Staying Alive and You Got to Be Real. All these things to really just get some blood pumping and get build some energy and really just have some fun. It was truly not the first time I used joy and gratitude to find peace, but not the last. Right after I was discharged, my first oncologist came in to talk to me and told me it looked like six months of chemo, oxaliplatin infusions, followed by a take-home chemo infusion for another two days, and that would be an every two-week cycle. And they would do a PET scan at the end of that cycle. I challenged immediately asking, why would they do six months of an intervention without testing for efficacy? It just didn't make sense to my brain that that was a rational decision. And they said, she said, listen, Julie, this is just the way it is. We will do the treatment and they will test for effective effectiveness six months later with a PET scan. Once again, I lost it and couldn't stop crying. I wasn't willing to do six months of chemo without testing for effectiveness. I had no idea chemo resistance was a thing. So honestly, I'm not really sure why I really was so emphatic about this. I just knew that if I had data to show it was working, I could handle the most difficult side effects chemo would throw at me. I went home pretty convinced that I wasn't going to do chemotherapy because I was deeply, which deeply scared my family and friends, but I knew that there was something, I needed data in between those chemo sessions to really help drive me. A few days later, I met with a nationally recognized herbalist, acupuncturist, Madiri level two trained Chinese medicine doctor named Oscar Sierra. Oscar asked me why I was there. And, and I said, I wasn't willing to bet my life on a chemo or an, any sort of intervention where we weren't actually tracking data in between. And Oscar shared with me a couple of things that really changed my entire approach. The first is he said, you need chemo. Let me tell you, your cancer is bigger than what you can do on your own. So please reconsider and use chemo. But I can teach you how to use blood markers to show effectiveness and predict that cancer activity. So I immediately was hooked and was interested because I was like, wait a minute, my doctor just told me this wasn't possible, but you're telling me we can track different markers in my blood. And he was like, absolutely. But then he went on to tell me, that he could prepare my body so I wouldn't have all the side effects of chemo and for that he could help me build alchemy in my body so the treatment would actually work more effectively and it would make my body inhospitable to cancer and help me proactively fight as well. Oscar bestowed on me the exact knowledge that I was searching for, this exact knowledge that would go on to save my life. I said many times that although I survived stage four, aggressive, inoperable, and chemo-resistant colon cancer, I think the process was actually harder on my nearest and dearest. I was able to devote my life to the research and developing a strategy to holistically address all aspects of my cancer. I was able to look under every single rock to identify sources of disease, change all aspects of my life, and I had the resource to consider anything I could imagine as I live in a medically dense metro area. But they had to watch me build a strategy and take a path never before traveled. Once I said I would do chemo, everyone but me breathed a sigh of relief. I was so scared that I would either die or never feel as good as I did right then. So I studied like crazy to identify every single possible side effect and build a strategy for how I could nullify the worst aspects of cancer treatment. Because again, cancer is the number two reason for death, but medical error is the number three reason. As an example of my, my strategy for neuropathy, I looked at a couple different things across the six toolboxes. For example, alpha lipoic acid is a beautiful nutraceutical that can help reduce neuropathy, as well as walking daily or doing rosemary baths or considering acupuncture. Or for lymphatic training, I choose to see a massage therapist, reflexologist, walk daily, brunch my skin to reduce my lymph, lymph system, and jump on a trampoline. I spent my time in pursuit of health 
So I, I ate what would serve me. I exercised daily. I ate more than 40 supplements daily and still do. I was willing to do anything it took to heal from cancer. I even gave myself several enemas so I could treat my colon directly before I started immunotherapy. I literally was willing to do anything it took. But if I would have gone with what the first oncologist suggested, I would be dying a very slow, miserable death. She would have given me the exact standard of care for my treatment I could get anywhere in America. But something inside me knew that wasn't enough. Here's what I now want to understand and share with you. We expect our doctors to be God, but they're a direct result of the education they, they are provided, which infor- unfortunately in 1910 became focused on only laboratory or pharmaceutical science, because that is the only thing that could be patented and profited from. That came from the Flexner Report, which was published in 1909. In fact, if a medical school taught anything around, around alternative healing, they lost all of their funding. This was a really important change in the way that we treated uh, healthcare in America. In fact, healthcare system was then shifted to treat disease instead of build health. It wasn't intentional, but this damage from the Flexner report is clear. In addition, we know two people can, from the exact same genetic DNA can have the same cancer indicator, but it only is expressed in one of them. So we know there's simply more at play than genetics and biology. When you look at the science of epigenetics, and epigenetics is the study of how your behaviors and environment can cause changes that affect the way your genes work. You can see how important it is to understand and pay attention to that diet and lifestyle and how those are impacting you. As an example, when I began to research this, I started to look at what is the curriculum of many different medical programs around the US. And most of the medical school curriculums simply didn't even mention nutrition or diet and lifestyle. But this one example of a wonderful medical school here in in the Atlanta metro area did at least mention nutrition. But when you look at this, you can see how small nutrition is compared to pharmacology, which spans an entire year. But nutrition spans part of two different months. So we really, really need to think about what we hold our doctors accountable for because their, their lane and their expertise is quite limited. And when you look at how the job of physician has changed over time, both due to the environment they practice in and the requirements from uh, from insurance and others, it's imperative we start to take a more active role in our healthcare strategy. I was always a studious but fun-loving person. I always worked hard and play hard. I was taught at an early age that it was okay to challenge assumptions and to build your own approach. I have an extremely high entrepreneurial spirit, and I spent the last 20 years working for industrial organizational psychology consulting firms. So I understand how to connect business and talent strategy, which means I know how to select a team and execute a strategy. The truth is that every part of my history played a role in how I developed my strategy and how I built this approach. From my early career days when I did job analysis interviews to understand how you break down a job into smaller components, to when I worked in the healthcare industry and partnered with the American Hospital Association to identify the talent requirements for healthcare executives, doctors, and nurses after Obamacare was passed, to my spin selling training 20 years ago, to the fact that I was a card carrying member of the American College of Healthcare Executives and the Chicago Health Executives Forum. So I understood how healthcare executives make decisions. So my undergraduate days when I was a statistics tutor, it all played a part in my strategy. I was able to look at the research and understand how little we actually know how to heal from cancer and really how little data we have on almost anything. For example, when you look at clinical trials, we don't know which of these patients were taking additional supplements or getting eight hours of of sleep at night or reducing their risk and and reducing their stress. We simply don't know anything beyond the pharmaceutical drug they took and why that was successful. But now I'm betting my life on this. And when I started to understand the lack of data we had, I knew I couldn't just rely on what people were feeding to me. So I built my strategy using six different toolboxes, as you saw on the previous screen. These two boxes are pharmaceuticals, botanicals, nutraceuticals, eating habits and diet, lifestyle, and alternative health and healing therapies. I was able to look at the research and understand how little we know about any of these toolboxes besides pharmaceutical toolboxes. And when I did this, I was able to build a healthcare team of 10 different doctors 
including my oncologist, surgeon, gastroenterologist, but also a naturopath, a chiropractor, an acupuncturist, a reflexologist, and a massage therapist, as you saw, because they were each dying to impact different parts of my cancer strategy. One of the things that I mentioned earlier that Oscar taught me was how critical it is to prepare your body for chemotherapy. So a few weeks before I, I began, I, we built out a supplement and a diet strategy. So my diet could be fighting in fighting shape before I actually began. He also taught me that we could get some additional genetic testing done on the actual tumor that it would allow us to do personalized medicine. That, that test took over 20 phone calls, emails, text messages, and requests to get them to actually order it from that first oncologist I mentioned. But when I did receive that genetic testing back the very night before I began chemotherapy, I knew right away that I was a candidate for immunotherapy. So I had a solid plan B in case our plan A didn't work. When I asked my oncologist the night before I, or the morning I was, was due to start chemotherapy, and I said, listen, I actually think I would prefer to start immunotherapy because frankly, that's more of a drug that suits me. I'm all about empowerment. And that's exactly what immunotherapy does instead of chemotherapy that's kind of designed bringing a bazooka to kill a fruit, fruit fly. And his response was, chemo is tried and true. And in general, people with mismatch repair like you do better with this anyway. Apex is the appropriate treatment and we will never have to deal with this again. And if for some reason it does come back, then we'll consider immunotherapy. We'll plan to do eight cycles of KPOX, but no one really can make it through eight, all cy eight cycles because the side effects are so miserable. So we're hoping for five and we'll see what, if we, how we need to pivot as needed. That's also worrisome that they're planning for eight because that's what the research tells us. But because the side effects were so miserable, they didn't think we could get through all eight. Once I started chemotherapy, I had a really hard time mentally accepting that this was my fate as I truly didn't think um, I would ever feel okay again after hearing so many examples of people with neuropathy, uh, stories with cold sensitivity, people couldn't open their refrigerator or drive their car after they were done with chemotherapy. I built my toolbox and was prepared as humanly possible for the chemo tsunami that was about to hit me. I'd been on every Facebook group possible to learn from other cancer patients what helped to reduce the misery. I learned so many, so many valuable things, such as to prepare for hand and foot issues by wearing gloves at night and by putting on uh, utter cream lotion, or to make sure you're wearing chapstick or specific, specific lip balm to make sure your lips don't crack, or to ice during my infusion. So as you can see here in this picture, I actually had bottles of frozen water and, and ice packs on my feet, and I would eat ice chips for the entire intervention. So that way I wouldn't have the debilitating cold sensitivity. So I would be able to open my refrigerator or touch my floor or touch something cold or drink something cold after I'd had an infusion. In fact, I'd advocate several times for myself in order to ice because it had never been done at my health system for, for colon cancer. Multiple different nurses said it's no, that's not possible. It's, it's we're, not, we're not going to allow it. So I had to go and discuss with my oncologist where I finally acquiesced and said, we'll let you do it. But if you start to feel any pain, you have to immediately stop icing. Luckily, all the prep work I did for chemo worked out beautifully. And besides some jaw issues like first bite syndrome and some exhaustion, I didn't encounter any of the tough side effects. I went to see Oscar after my first session and he was able to identify, I actually had more cancer activity in my blood than I did before by tracking it a marker called CA-199 which he explained could either be cancer dust after the chemo or an indicator I was chemo resistant. He suggested I follow up with the same test after my key second chemo session to see if I was higher yet again. And if so, I needed to consider pivoting to a plan B. This game was as much in my head as it was in my body. During my first chemo session, there was a very amazing and kind chaplain who came to talk to me. And after realizing how stressed I was, gave me permission to have some fun while I was there which meant I was about to use my second skill set, which is to throw my first theme party. Luau was the theme, and I dressed up and brought in 60 gift bags for everyone who was in a chair or any staff member. I really, um, and those were filled with Maximize Joy stickers and candy and lays and hand state bracelets that said ride the wave and custom sugar cookies for everyone who was in the room. It was a ton of fun. And it was a pretty tough day when I walked in that day because they were just transferring into a new electronic medical record. So even the staff was in a pretty miserable place. But after I walked up to the first person and said, you want to get laid at chemo? The smiles broke out, laughter began, and truly you could see the ripple of joy across the entire infusion center. It was a very beautiful way to channel that pre-infusion anxiety 
but it also was a way to share joy with others in a moment where I was feeling particularly weak. The first party was a complete success and we had so much fun. Um, even everyone that was around me, nurses were coming to thank me. They told me how special it was of what I was doing. But at the very end of my session, a woman walked up to me and she said to me, Julia, I didn't know that I would meet you today. And I honestly didn't think I was going to make it through today. I planned to, to consider ending things tonight. But after meeting you and feeling your energy and seeing your ride the wave bracelet, I know I can make it through the next few weeks and I can make it to the next stage. And at that moment, these parties went from silly and fun to sacred because I understood that other people were just as scared as I was and were feeling so much stress. After this second chemo, my luau chemo, the blood test showed I, in fact, was chemo resistant. I texted my oncologist to let them know I wanted to pivot to immunotherapy. But he rejected the data I was saying and saying CA-19-9 is not data that we would ever consider. So we'd like to consider some other data points before we would consider a pivot in strategy. So I welcomed him to pull whatever data he wanted. And he did a CT DNA and a PET scan that reinforced the cancer was, in fact, growing in three places, two of which were inoperable and at a very aggressive and alarming speed. Without Oscar's information, I'm not sure how many more chemo sessions I would have endured, but it would have offered no cancer support. It would have only done harm to my body. And in fact, um, it would have been, it would have meant, meant that six months later, I would have had cancer all over my body. And the likelihood of my survival is quite slim, literally less than 10%. Luckily, I knew I was a candidate for immunotherapy and my oncologist was able to get me scheduled for it the next week. I was scared and very alone. I was very alone. And the sure thing that he told me would definitely treat cancer, in fact, didn't treat cancer and wasn't a sure thing for me. I continued the infusion, the, the infusion parties when I began immunotherapy. And in fact, my first infusion party was superhero thing. We had so much fun. And immunotherapy is a much shorter experience than chemo. It has fewer side effects and less worry. But the big worry with immunotherapy is that it will, it will in, in fact, in, attack your healthy organs. So it's really, really imperative to reduce all the inflammation in your blood as much as possible. Oscar did a test to measure inflammation on my blood called Meliza. And with that, he was able to identify the exact foods that were creating these inflammation res results in my body, which as, you, as I may have shared earlier, inflammation is one of the things that so quickly feeds cancer. And by doing this, I was able to ensure my immune system would not over rev. In fact, it could, we could keep it in low standards. And so therefore it wouldn't be a fear that it would start to attack my healthy organs and, and, and liver. But this was a gut punch as I realized I would have to upend everything in my body and my diet to make this treatment really work. But again, I was willing to do whatever it took to be cancer free. In addition, I'd been diagnosed with a secondary diagnosis of chronic idiopathic urticaria 13 years earlier. And I'd been to specialists and doctors at multiple different states all over the country. I'd had multiple different tests. Nothing could figure out what, what, what was causing this, these hives, these spontaneous hives to create every single day. In fact, before surgery, I was taking, uh, I had infusions twice a month. Um, I, I, it was a biologic infusion and shot. I was taking three pharmaceuticals daily and up to eight Zyrtex every single day to mask these hives. And this one test not only unlocked why I was having inflammation to help support cancer, but it also helped me unlock why I had chronic idiopathic urticaria. As when I stopped eating these foods, I stopped having hives. This is something that every single doctor I spoke with said it would never, I would never be able to figure this out. But I was truly healing from the inside out. I also turned to gratitude and tried to focus my energy and how I stack my deck and how I what I have going right versus what I have going wrong in my life. My next infusion party was gratitude is grieving. My parents came to help me celebrate and have Thanksgiving together. This was also the week that I had my CTNA retested. And so when I share with you my CTNA results, as you can see here, right after I started chemo, September 14th, you can see my CTDNA results are actually significantly higher the beginning of October, which is what convinced my doctor to allow me to use immunotherapy. But after two sessions of immunotherapy, we did this test again, and we were able to see that my results had gone significantly down. In fact, they'd gone from 153.92 to 12.19. So after two sessions, we knew that we were succeeding in the battle. But that wasn't it. That really did help me gain all the success I could possibly have and get gain so much excitement. But the wind in my sails was, was only gaining. 
And in fact, I knew over the next few months, I had to keep my, my, my head down and focus on gratitude, joy, peace, exercise, and a healthy diet. By doing this, I was able to reduce that CT DNA all the way down to negative. So as of right now, I actually have no cancer activity in my blood, which is such a gift. But through this, I was able to throw, as I mentioned, several of these parties and bring joy to everyone I could around me. I knew my strategy was working, but as I was starting to throw these parties and work through this, I started to have some survival guilt. I kept thinking that I'm only alive because I live in a healthcare dense city. I've developed my own holistic strategy. I chose the best care team imaginally, imaginable, and I had the financial means and support network to allow me to access the very best of the best. And I had more than anything, I had Oscar to guide me through this process. I knew I would have had a completely different experience without him and without all these advantages and likely would not be alive. While in late February, I got the official word I was cancer-free and it was time to celebrate. I, that list of, and that celebration lasted about one day. And then I realized I have the opportunity to help other people and help them have the exact same experience I had. And I got to work building Mojo. It feels like a social responsibility to teach others what I was taught and to give them all the same advantages that I had going through this and build a scalable, and hopefully as we get through this, a more affordable approach to healing and curing cancer. I studied the experience from a cancer patient and now I built a collection of companies to holistically address the pain points faced by all cancer patients and cancer care providers alike. I'm so excited for this potential. This provides a gaining the data set we need to actually understand what heals cancer. That I've, I'm, I'm building a coalition. I'm working with many others around the country. And I'm asking you to be part of this journey. Thank you so much for taking the time to learn more about my history and experience. And I certainly hope to work with you in the future.